I have the uh, daunting task of summarizing 2,000 years in two sentences, so I'll avoid it and hope that you saw the, uh, the, the last tape, which was basically a, uh, uh, the movement so far is to present something like a traditional history of ideas, but if you've noticed with little rejoinders along the way that suggest that that history of ideas is not innocent, not as though it were being presented in the way that the National Association of Scholars would have you believe, books being selected as though by very intelligent readers because they're the best books. That isn't always wrong, but the story of the survival of books and the formations of canons clearly has other factors. Couldn't be accidental that the books we've discussed so far and the movements are white, male, you basically through the European axis and will continue to be so. And that, that those books got canonized cannot be a total accident. In other words, it just couldn't be prima facie, totally accidental that that occurred. Uh, so that would give you reason to suspect that there are other factors. See, it's not the argument that there are no factors of merit in the formation of a canon or a group of books called philosophy books or history books, but that the only factor can't be merit. There must be other factors, material factors factors of groups that are oppressed, and so on. And those I'll get to later. But, so I'm not going to rehash uh, the rather quick run-through of that 2,000-year period. Instead, I'm going to jump right in to what I've already dis mentioned this man's name before, mention it again. I'll, run, I'll jump right in to modernity. Now, modernity is a word that's thrown around a lot and in many contexts now in discussions of art and discussions of uh, politics and in dis all over the place, sociology. In fact, sociology was born from a distinction, modern sociology, from a distinction between modern and traditional societies. Now, that is not a left-wing distinction that only Marx had. You know, Marx wasn't the only one that noticed that, as it were, capitalism was different than feudalism. So did Toynus so did Max Weber, and so did everyone else. So did Charlie Chaplin. In modern times, Charlie Chaplin knows that something's happened, right? New kind of movements, the machines, I mean, this is not a particularly... So what we're going to do now is to move into a new kind of world in which the problems of everyday life, from which philosophical problems arise, in which they try to address in a certain way. Now that way is not simply as a compensation, although I have presented that as one aspect of it, there also may be a way to evade the problems. That's the sense in which Marx uses the word ideology, you know, to evade, cover up, or legitimate some illegitimate feature of the problems in everyday life. And sometimes theories may even help respond to them. You may think here of Dewey on progressive education. In any case, the, the, the ethical views we're going to discuss now belong to modernity, to that modern project that is historically and symbolically understood to begin somewhere around the French Revolution, understood by Marx as the victory of a class, a class of basically merchants over a class of aristocrats with the help of a massive number of workers who see more to gain under the merchants than under the aristocrats. So that's a, a, that's a brief story, but I still think a fairly plausible one. You know? At least in the absence of better stories, we stick with the best ones we have. So if you combine Max Weber's understanding of modernity, which has to do with bureaucracy, the state, and the increasing rationalization of modern life, the areas subject to rational procedural rules, that's one half of the story, and then the increasing commodification or the extent to which the economy plays a role in shaping everyday life, those two halves of the story together, as it were for me, form the break into modernity from earlier societies. These ethical theories we'll discuss now are very different than the other ones. I could present our other ethical views, like the Greek view of excellence, the Roman view of hedonistic pleasure, the Christian view of imitating the life of Christ, to be a, a Christian, a knight of faith, and so on. Those were character-based views about how to live in a society. 
But with the advent of modernity, a new problem arises, and that's that human subjects for the first time get to be fragmented, as it were, into individual atoms. Now, it's very important to understand that this concept of the individual is a historical one. That what we understand is our isolated little psyche, that little tri private spot in our head, and the little wall of our body as being us, is not, some, is not a datum of factum, but something that is theoretically constructed and developed historically from other and differing views. In fact, on the planet today, there are differing views about it. Now, this new individual, according to Max Weber, would have a task that his feudal predecessor couldn't have had. At least under feudalism, no matter how lowly the serf, his life meant something in this grander drama, the battle between God and the devil, one that we can still enjoy vicariously by watching The Exorcist, right? We go, oh, I remember that, Exorcist, yeah, power of Christ, you know, and you go, well, it's great, you know. You can kind of vicariously enjoy the past. It's one of the features of this society we live in. Uh, in any case, the important point here is that the new theories will not respond, as it were, to character, because what they will respond to are individual, individuated actions, single actions. One way this distinction is made in philosophy is that previous ethical theories were virtue ethics. That meant about the formation of good folks in good societies. Under, in, under bourgeois views of ethics, like Kant's, Mills, and others, it won't be, ethics won't be about the formation of good folks in good societies. It will be a rather narrow inquiry into whether action A, B, or C is the correct one to perform. In other words, like everything else, ethics will become more instrumental and more quantitative. So if these views sound to you clearer than the sort of ways of life that I've presented rather broadly, they are clearer and more quantitative, but for very deep historical reasons because they're trying to make up for a deficit that's based on individuals now being fragmented and separated in a society where social bonds are not as fundamental as procedural legal relations in the, in the state or as important as economic relations which become, for the first time, a structuring principle of society. And that's not meant to be a negative remark. I mean, if you think so, wait till I talk about Marx. I mean, I think Marx had more good things to say about capitalism than Bill Buckley. And in the manifesto, if you read it, it's his greatest, greatest system ever. Unfortunately, it's the worst too. Well, we live in it, so we experience some of both. I mean, that's not that bad an account. Anyway, that's, that's all the background I want to do because now we're moving from virtue ethics to a kind of ethics that's supposed to answer for us individual subjects who no longer have the background meanings to draw on for right action. In other words, in, in the feudal period, a right action is one recommended by mom and dad is well brought up by 